Hello, everyone. We are going to talk with Mr. Nisim Bedekar today. He is Assistant Professor of Japanese at English and Foreign Languages University, EFLU, Hyderabad. He has a vast teaching, translation, and interpretation experience in the industry. He has, to his credit, publications of Japanese short stories translated into Marathi, as well as a handbook of Japanese culture in Marathi. He has also contributed translations of Japanese short stories to several Marathi magazines and newspapers. He is the recipient of B.R. Bhagwat Award for translation of the short story Mikan by Rainosuke Akutagawa Rinosuke. into Marathi. Sorry? Rinosuke, that's the pronunciation. Rinosuke Akutagawa. Akutagawa. Okay. Uh, sorry and thank you for the correction. Into Marathi by Akil Bharatiya Marathi Balkumar Sahitya Sanstha, Pune, in 2007. In addition to Japanese, he also knows many other languages like Korean, Portuguese, Esperanto, and of course, Hindi, Marathi, and English. Welcome, Mr. Nisim Bedekar. Welcome thank to the show. Thank you very show. much. Thank you. I would like to start by asking you about your contributions to the Diwali issues or magazines this year. And they are all in Marathi. Can you tell us about it? Uh, this year, um, I contributed for uh, uh, Diwali issue of uh, Padmagandha, brought out by uh, Padmagandha Prakashan Pune. Uh, uh, this year, uh, they had a theme, uh, you know, different cultures, different lands and different cultures. So I wrote uh, two articles, uh, one about uh, Japanese proverbs, uh, in which I'm, I gave examples of some interesting Japanese proverbs and how they uh, depict the Japanese culture. Mm -hmm. And another article uh, about uh, Japanese monk, Zen uh, Buddhist monk, uh, who was very famous for uh, his, uh, uh, his witty stories, like almost like uh, we can say Birbal, uh, Birbal, he was like a Birbal of Japan. Oh. So one article about him. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's for uh, Padmagandha, the Wale issue of uh, Padmagandha. Mm -hmm. Then uh, for, um, uh, there is one more uh, Diwali issue published uh, from Solapur called uh, Maitra. Mm -hmm. And for that I have uh, contributed uh, to Japanese stories. Uh, and uh, another issue uh, uh, called Password, uh, brought out by unique uh, unique features, Pune. Uh, for them also, I, I contributed a Japanese Japanese language story. Nice. Yeah, so I think that's about it. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> yes. Not, not yeah. much, really. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to ask you, when did you realize that you have a flair for languages? Uh, I think uh, right from my school days, I, I liked languages mm -hmm. uh, compared to, you know, uh, subjects like uh, maths or science. I, I mm -hmm. liked languages and I also scored better in languages. I uh, and and I, I like to read uh, right, mm -hmm. right since my childhood days. So mm -hmm. I, I, I realized that uh, like I, I really love languages and maybe I'm good at it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so... That's great. Childhood days. It goes back to the childhood, right? <laughs> and uh, then, how did you choose Japanese as a subject to pursue? So, uh, actually, I've uh, I've done my uh, tenth plus two in uh, science. So, uh -huh. uh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, you know, after tenth, uh, because all all my schoolmates uh, they chose science. So, obviously, yeah. there is this peer influence and peer. Mm -hmm peer pressure maybe yeah. so without without thinking i really whether i really want to up for science i i decided mm -hmm. to go for it mm -hmm. and by the time i were i passed 10 plus 2 i realized that i am not really interested i was not really interested in going for uh, engineering mm -hmm. uh, and i and, and i already dropped uh, biology uh, after 10 so oh. me medical was out <laughs> so uh, yeah and uh, so uh, when I was I was still um, uh, taking my 10 plus 2 board exams, mm -hmm. uh, my father uh, uh, knew one professor from Jawaharlal Nehru University 
Uh, mm-hmm. In fact, uh, you might be knowing his name. Now he is no more. Professor G.P. Deshpande, uh, very well-known dramatist. And, mm-hmm. um, and, and one of our um, uh, family friends, his uh, daughter was studying Chinese there in JNU. Mm-hmm. Okay. So my father knew that uh, you know JNU is a place where you can you can have you can do graduation and post graduation in foreign languages, mm-hmm. and so he had uh, he had requested uh, Professor G P Deshpande to send him one uh, uh, you know application form without even mm-hmm. telling me anything, and then mm-hmm. after my ten plus two exam was finished and uh, after a few days uh, uh, he just said let look I mean. Um, I I know and uh, you know that uh, you are not really uh, you know uh, uh, interested in engineering and and you like languages uh, you are you are doing better in languages so uh, uh, how about making a career in foreign languages mm-hmm. so I said fine okay I mean um, so uh, then he told me that uh, you know about that application form oh. and then uh, then we had to decide what language to choose. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, uh, like in Pune, already so many st- uh, students study uh, European languages like French or German, Russian, uh, mm-hmm. now Spanish. I mean, this was like back in 1994. Mm-hmm. So, so then uh, we decided it's better to go for an Asian languages. And at that time, then the ch- choice was either Chinese or Japanese. And then considering, uh, you know, uh, our India's relations with China and Japan, uh, mm-hmm. definitely we have better relations with Japan and uh, we don't have any political issues. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, then I decided to go for Japanese. And, oh. and of course, I, I, was, uh, I was also interested in uh, East Asia and East Asian cultures. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. any, I mean, Chinese or Japanese, anything would have been fine. But then I mm-hmm. chose Japanese. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, when I was learning German, I had this misconception in my mind that German uh, drawing language, so only they can learn Japanese and Chinese. So that is what I used yeah. to have in mind <laughs> back then. Uh, because of the pictographic script. Yes. Because they use the characters. Correct. Correct. The pictographic script. Right. Uh, no, not really. Uh, mm-hmm. Because. Uh, uh, you know there is a way of writing those uh, those characters or pictographs okay. and uh, there are some rules and we call it like they because traditionally they used to write with uh, strokes uh, with brush, brush so huh. uh, so we we call it like stroke order so first like mm-hmm. first which stroke you are going to write then second third so we mm-hmm. have this stroke order so uh, so when when they teach us uh, 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 you know how to write Japanese. We just have to memorize that st- stroke order, and once you, uh, you know, your hand gets used to writing mm-hmm. in that correct stroke order, you can actually anybody can, you know, write the those pictographs mm-hmm. very very fast. So uh, mm-hmm. and nothing to do with drawing at all. I mean anybody uh-huh. and and okay. I myself, I I mean okay in the childhood I was uh, I used to draw a bit, but I was never good at drawing. Uh-huh. So, and, and even I, I managed to learn that language. So, uh-huh. I think anybody, anybody can, can do that. Yes. Okay. Yes. That is great. Now the concept is clear. <laughs> great, great. Then uh, I would like to ask you about uh, your, uh, you have done this national eligibility test with Junior Research Fellowship Award. And uh, it was conducted by uh, UGC. So that was also in Japanese, right? Uh, no, actually, uh, that is, a, you know, the UGC net national mm-hmm. uh, eligibility test. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is a test uh, compulsory for lecturership. Uh, if you mm-hmm. want to go for lecturership in a university, mm-hmm. uh, you mm-hmm. have to pass uh, the UGC net exam uh, mm-hmm. in your subject. Mm-hmm. Uh, if it is available, like the in some subjects, the exam is not available. So mm-hmm. they have to take the exam in some allied subject or some. Mm-hmm. So, uh, uh, so the uh, there are three three uh, papers in uh, mm-hmm. three different papers in that exam. And mm-hmm. first paper is the common paper for everybody, anybody who takes UGC net. So okay. that is uh, based on uh, general knowledge and reasoning and uh, uh, 
um, language aptitude and teaching aptitude they tell you such things hmm. and then paper paper 2 and paper 3 are related to your subjects so in my case they were related to japanese hmm. um, so then there are questions about uh, japanese history japanese literature uh, hmm. uh, you know questions related to grammar then uh, uh, we had to write a short essay we had to translate a passage Oh, okay. uh, that was uh, again. That was way back in two thousand, and now the UGC net pattern has changed okay. uh, since last mm-hmm. last many years. In fact, and now I hear that they have made everything objective, uh, all mm-hmm. multiple choice questions. Okay. So the current format of uh, UGC net, uh, mm-hmm. I'm not really very uh, aware of it, but people do keep saying that because it's uh, it has become objective. it has actually become quite difficult because uh, now mm-hmm. anybody can uh, you know make any question like for example uh, mm-hmm. some random sentence and uh, from which novel this sentence is and 1 2 3 4 you have to so it has actually become difficult that's what okay. people say <laughs> okay <laughs> right uh, then uh, you have completed the intensive course of japanese language in tokyo so i think i'm taking you back to your Uh, education uh, days and all yeah. so how was that experience of learning the language in that country yes it was very good experience mm-hmm. uh, it was a one year uh, scholarship uh, offered uh-huh. by the ministry of education uh, government mm-hmm. of japan uh, mm-hmm. after after i finished my graduation a ba honors in japanese mm-hmm. um and the, there was a like we, we were uh, recommended to our universities Mm-hmm. and uh, there was a written exam and interview at the japanese embassy uh, for mm-hmm. for the selection of candidates uh, mm-hmm. so um, i i got a chance to study at a university called uh, waseda university in uh, mm-hmm. tokyo that's a, it's a private university but uh, one of the very uh, famous and prestigious uh, private universities in japan mm-hmm. and uh, that was a really uh, excellent experience because mm-hmm. uh, uh uh monday to friday we had this language related classes from uh, mm-hmm. almost from 9 to 4 with mm-hmm. a one break one hour break it in between and they covered different aspects of language uh, grammar linguistics uh, then even uh, there were courses on japanese history uh, literature mm-hmm. uh different linguistic skills like reading comprehension oral comprehension mm-hmm. uh, listening and uh, uh, so on um and uh, but more than the you know the academic learning part of it that mm-hmm. one year in japan that itself was was a, mm-hmm. a very good thing because uh, it was like total cu- cu- cultural immersion so mm-hmm. so the moment you you walk out of your uh, your residence mm-hmm. or your hostel room everything mm-hmm. you see here everything in japanese all street signs announcements everything mm-hmm. you have to ask for something it's uh, ask for directions ask for something you have to use japanese so your uh, spoken and uh, listening skills improve mm-hmm. and there are so many things that Uh, you observe when you are in the country which which mm. you cannot learn from textbooks or uh, you know what mm. what is taught mm. in the class so mm. um uh, uh, i mean watching watching japanese tv every day or watching mm. uh, japanese movies and now of course now uh, uh, it's all available uh, on the internet and youtube but uh, this mm. was in 1997 so again uh, mm. during during those days uh mm-hmm. unless and until you lived in japan you never got this kind of exposure so right. uh i mean i think it's not just for japanese for any uh, foreign language okay. i mean for somebody who is studying german um, mm-hmm. studying and living in germany that would you know give a totally different exposure uh, oh. than somebody who is who is who has never been there so yes. that immersion part is very important in Mm-hmm. Uh, for you know for any foreign language student i think mm-hmm. i believe mm-hmm. you are right absolutely then uh, i you have a vast uh, teaching experience so you have taught to you know undergraduates 
then uh, engineers, then at the embassy, also bachelor and master students, and also in the corporate sector. I mean, really a wide canvas. So how do you adjust with the you know changing target group of students? So how do you or do you devise new teaching methodologies or how do you go about? Not new teaching methodologies, but uh, now. if you ask me how do you adjust basically i have to adjust because <laughs> without adjusting it it will not be possible uh, in some cases uh, it is all fixed for example um, mm-hmm. i was um, i was teaching in the uh, cultural center of the japanese embassy so they had a fixed textbook and uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know uh, before i started teaching i had to observe the like uh, you know classes of uh, some native japanese teachers and uh, mm. uh, i had to follow the same uh, uh, their way of teaching mm. uh, when i started teaching then they also observed my lectures and then they gave feedback and then they gave suggestions uh, when i was teaching uh, briefly i was teaching in pune uh, to some uh, Uh, computer engineers uh, oh. teaching Japanese. So for that again, the textbook was fixed, and um, so I just had to follow follow those uh, those lessons, those dialogues. Um, so there was not much innovative thing on my part. Um, yeah, when it comes to teaching in a university, like yeah, mm-hmm. undergraduate or postgraduate, then of course. uh you are given a course and you are in charge of that course and the, then you have to do, you know think how you are going to teach the course what material teaching materials uh, you are going to use so mm-hmm. there you can experiment you can try out new things and of course you see how it goes with the students mm-hmm. um, the level of the students uh, whether they are finding it too easy or too difficult mm-hmm. um and then uh you know uh, based on that the feedback that you receive you can always uh, adjust so i think uh, it's just uh, you know something like going with the flow that mm-hmm. you try something see how it works if it is working well you go along with that mm-hmm. if it is not working well you make make adjustment so i i i guess that's how i i have okay. done so far great great then uh, you have worked as a translator in corporate sector and also in a as a freelancer capacity so uh, can you tell us the difference between this freelance translation i haven't done much actually i <laughs> just maybe uh, uh, four or five times freelance translation okay. i've done mm-hmm. uh, one was a company brochure which i had to translate from english into japanese then mm-hmm. um then uh, there was one um, uh, gentleman from the indian army and uh, mm-hmm. he was sent to japan on some official mission and uh, uh, he had to give some uh, speeches about india in japan so i translated his speeches into mm-hmm. japanese um uh, and then some other freelancing assignments i don't even remember what exactly <laughs> they were no um, problem so uh, uh, so in freelancing of course uh, the, the you know the the type of translation or the type of text texts were different mm-hmm. um corporate uh, i was i was working for 5 years as a pattern translator uh, in sutra systems in pune <laughs> so there i was i was translating uh, patent applications from japanese into english mm-hmm. so the i think the difference between uh, you know working as a freelancer and working for a corporate in fact most of the freelancers uh, who are doing freelancing they are mostly working for corporates i believe mm-hmm. i mean you get translation assignment for from some company mm-hmm. uh, in freelancing i think uh, you have more variety you get different kind of uh, texts to translate um again there also there are some freelancers who uh, specialize in a particular domain uh, like uh, far uh, you know uh, pharmaceutical related translations or uh, uh, translations related to uh, 
the the medical industry mm-hmm. or uh, commercial banking related translations mm-hmm. uh, or uh, it related translations mm-hmm. uh, uh, then uh, automobile automobile mm-hmm. related manufacturing industry mm-hmm. related translations so of course you have different domains so depending on whether you are willing to accept uh, you know do translations from all such domains mm-hmm. or whether you want to focus on one particular domain uh, you have that choice in uh, freelancing mm-hmm. you know what exactly to translate okay. in corporate i mean if you are working as a full time translator uh, for for a company then of course uh, you have a fixed job profile and that company has a mm-hmm. fixed uh, you know either it's a manufacturing company or an it company or it could be a bank or so uh, it's one kind of translation huh. i mean there is no variety and hmm. at times it can get monotonous hmm. and a bit boring right but again depending depending on uh, what kind of uh, company and what kind of translation is it 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 can be very challenging and exciting also hmm. Hmm. i think you specialized in the translation of patent documents right so yeah, you know, i can't say specialized but yeah five <laughs> years i i worked as a yeah a patent mm-hmm. translator okay. uh okay. yeah so like i said in uh, i was working in a company called sutra systems mm-hmm. and uh, uh, uh they had this uh, uh sort of uh, arrangement with a a patent office in tokyo it was called uh, uh, sakai sakai is a japanese name sakai international patent office uh, so sipo s i p o um so uh, we used to get uh, patent applications in japanese from them and mm-hmm. we had to translate them into english and uh, send them back uh, basically what this office used to do is uh, they used to get uh, Uh, patent applications from various uh, japanese uh, companies mm-hmm. and if they wanted to file a patent of their what, whatever product uh, they had invented in mm-hmm. america in you know in the united states then mm-hmm. they had to uh, you know file that patent application into english, english. They, they like you you cannot send a patent application written into japanese for filing a patent in the united states mm-hmm. so that job we were doing that uh, mm-hmm. the patent applications that they wanted to file in uh, america we were translating into english uh, mm-hmm. english from uh, for them mm-hmm. and um, yes it it was it was a, a exciting but also very very challenging job mm-hmm. uh, because uh, the language uh, of the patent if you see any patent application it has a very peculiar language uh, mm. it's like a combination of uh, technical and legal language mm. so um, uh, especially the uh, like in a patent application you have a section called claims that mm. the claim is where like these are the things that you want to get a patent of mm. so the claims part uh it's it's very tricky to translate and uh, the kind of words you are allowed to use the kind of words which you are not allowed to use mm. uh you know like it would start something like um, suppose some uh, elect an electromagnetic disk device doing doing whatever wherein um mm. you know uh, a part this 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 uh, carries out this 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 mm. um a part Uh, a portion this uh, uh it it includes something and you know it would go on and go on and then we had to use a lot of like commas and semicolons and uh, there were very strict rules again like when you are supposed to use a comma when you are supposed to use a colon or a semicolon and uh, uh very strict usage of articles also Um, so uh, for example uh, and mm-hmm. you know the different like suppose if there was uh, some machine uh, and they were describing its diff- various parts and components they would be numbered mm-hmm. so then we had to remember like we always had to be very careful so um um like some some a driver a driver mm-hmm. 79 a driver 81 so they were mm-hmm. two different drive and hmm. again 
like if you say um a device and if you say the device again that's a huge difference like a device can be anything but when you are talking so a device a and when you say the device a then you are talking about the device that you have mentioned previously so we have to be very very careful about such things um usage of articles and uh, punctuation so um, yeah it was it was very very tough yeah tough yeah hmm. and uh, i mean the translation you are uh, doing in the literary area so that is totally different from this technical translation so obviously i mean no no relation whatsoever it's two di- two worlds <laughs> apart two different words two worlds apart Yes. <laughs> that's right and uh, i wanted to ask you how do you select your texts for translation for literary work for example uh... mostly i select the literary works which i like um, hmm. because that is very important i mean if you don't li- i mean especially in literary translation if you don't like the text that you are translate translating you would produce a very horrible translation so uh, okay. obviously i mean if i if i find some story very interesting and i mm-hmm. like it then then you have that feeling that oh i have to you know i have to convey it to people who who, mm-hmm. who don't know japanese so mm-hmm. i mean that is the motivation of literary translation that mm-hmm. you read something very interesting you find it interesting you like it and then you have this inner urge that uh, you know now there are people who cannot because they don't know japanese then they 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 cannot access this story they cannot read this story they cannot enjoy this story so mm-hmm. uh, you have to convey this story to them and then you feel like translating it so uh, mm-hmm. uh, yeah i mean the, and sometimes of course um, uh, when you get requests to contribute stories Uh, mm-hmm. from magazines for example uh, then mm-hmm. sometimes they have some particular themes um, mm-hmm. uh, you know um, or they also have um, restrictions about the length of the length of the stories oh. or uh, you know so accordingly you uh, you select the text i mean um, mm-hmm. uh, for example uh, there was a there was a theme um, about freedom then i i chose a story which depicted that so similarly but uh, apart from that mostly i i choose the text which which i really like like to translate mm. <laughs> mm. correct otherwise it will be really a very dull job to do something like that uh, mostly i mean of <laughs> course uh, i mean if if you get a you know commissioned translation mm-hmm. like if you get an offer to translate some mm-hmm. stories and or some novel then of course um, i mean uh, you know. you have to you have to do a good job but yeah. um, otherwise yeah uh, i would say the first choice or the first uh, criterion uh, for selecting the text would be for the translator literary translator would be whether whether he or she likes that particular mm. text it's very important Hmm. correct okay and uh, i have seen that uh, in the literary translation you have handled various genres like uh, short stories then children stories i mean translating them then novel extracts so uh, does a translator get any special training for this is it available uh, no um hmm. now in india as far as i know there is there is no special training for uh, literary translation mm-hmm. uh, at least in foreign languages i don't know about uh, in english or other indian languages okay uh, in in europe and america yes there are uh, courses mm-hmm. like there are there is a, like a masters degree in literary translation uh, masters mm-hmm. degree in literary studies and, mm-hmm. but not in india and um, i have never received any such training so i just started translating and uh, you know i just with experience i started i went on learning and so mm-hmm. i i learned it the hard way you know uh, mm-hmm. the okay. um, 
like translate make mistakes learn from them and go ahead <laughs> that that way okay yeah. you taught yeah. yourself right sort of <laughs> <laughs> then uh, moving on to your work as an interpreter have you you have worked as an interpreter also right uh, again not much very much. few okay. few just okay. three or four uh, interpretations okay uh, actually i i prefer translation more mm -hmm. than interpretation mm -hmm. uh, okay <laughs> sure then uh, you had you have mentioned this uh, article about japanese proverbs so yes. can you tell i would i would like to know in detail about it if you can give some examples also uh, the article proverbs... that i have written for this yes. diwali issue right right uh, yes uh, so uh, i i try to highlight uh, mm -hmm. you know how japanese proverbs come from japanese culture Mm -hmm. and then i gave some examples so for example japan is an island country mm -hmm. surrounded by sea so sea is very important in japanese culture and japanese mm -hmm. life so mm -hmm. you have lots of proverbs uh, you know coming from the sea related mm -hmm. to the sea mm -hmm. um, so they have a proverb for example um, if you want to know about the sea ask the fisherman Um, so mm -hmm. uh, so you know like if you want to get a knowledge about some know about something you ask the expert in that field so mm -hmm. they use this um, metaphor okay um, then um um so many different uh, proverbs about sea mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay that will be a yeah. interesting read actually yes yeah mm -hmm. then uh, similarly um uh, again another important uh, feature in uh, uh, you know japanese proverbs is mountains because japan is again a mountain and mountainous mm -hmm. country right and uh, so um, mountain features a lot mm -hmm. in uh japanese proverbs mm -hmm. so um, so for example they have a proverb um um like even a dust will become in, become a mountain so like in marathi oh. we have you know thimbe thimbe tale sache so oh. in, in japanese <laughs> they use this yeah mountain yeah mm -hmm. um nice. and um or uh, you know one they have one proverb which uh, has uh, i would say see the proverb is uh, um a sea pirate uh, talks about sins of a mountain bandit you know? oh okay so um Mm -hmm. so uh, like in english you have this proverb the uh, kettle calls the pot black uh -huh. uh -huh. so it's something similar that uh, mm -hmm. the sea the sea pirate and the mountain bandits both are doing the same thing but mm -hmm. one is calling the other bad mm -hmm. so again you see the so the sea pirate and the mountain bandit so again mm -hmm. one is coming from the sea the other is coming from mm -hmm. the although both are both are robbers both are bandits like <laughs> right so one is working on the sea one is working in the mountains so mm. that is uh, very interesting i yes. find very typical yeah. je, very typically uh, japanese mm. mm -hmm. that's nice and uh, yeah. yeah yeah being in the literature field and a linguist i want to ask you what is the role of literature in our lives what's the role of literature in our lives but i would say um literature is a mirror of that particular culture and a culture or society so if you really want to understand a particular country or a culture or a society read mm -hmm. their literature mm -hmm. uh, because uh, literature comes from so many different things 
it mm-hmm. comes from their history it comes from their culture it uh, you know comes from uh, events that have taken part your you know taken uh, place in in that country which which are very important for those people mm-hmm. they can be very joyful events they can be very painful events also mm-hmm. uh, and also literature look, looking at their literature you will uh, understand uh, their values uh, their uh, concepts of good or bad or mm-hmm. you know their uh, their concepts of what is acceptable what is not acceptable mm-hmm. or how you are supposed to behave in a particular situation how how you are supposed to respond to a particular situation you know the societal expectations the social expectations uh, and whether uh, so so whether somebody follows them or whether somebody rebels against them so so mm-hmm. many things you you understand through literature mm-hmm. um so i think literature uh, that's like a mirror mirror of that particular country or a culture mm-hmm. or a society so uh, i mean for any learner of uh, foreign language mm-hmm. even if you are not very uh, very much interested in literature try to read at least something some stories something you will you will understand that that country and that culture better i think <laughs> that's a wonderful explanation actually yes <laughs> great then uh, one last question is you translate japanese to marathi and also japanese to english right so uh, what are the challenges you face while translating into a mother tongue and translating into a non mother tongue language so to say i haven't translated much into english i mean recently mm-hmm. uh, i translated a book of children's stories um, mm-hmm. from japanese into english Okay. Uh, but apart from that mostly my translations have been from japanese into marathi okay um, and uh, uh, there is a belief among literary translators and i agree with that that uh, when you are translating literature you are the target language the language you are translating into uh, as far as possible it has it it should be your mother tongue it should okay. be your mother tongue Mm-hmm. uh or i mean you should have a you should be so so fluent in your target language that it's almost like your mother tongue mm-hmm. uh i mean of course there are there are exceptions to that uh like i'll i'll give you one very interesting example um um uh, i've read i've read it in a a uh, book called literary translation a practical guide uh, it's by mm-hmm. an american uh, author called uh, clifford landers he he is a literary translator of from portuguese to english mm-hmm. and he uh, you know uh, there there was a very famous uh, a spanish to english literary translator translator mm-hmm. called uh, gregory rabasa maybe must have heard his name because uh, mm-hmm. he is responsible for translating many masterpieces of latin american literature into english uh, especially the nobel uh, nobel laureates gabriel garcia marquez you know oh, okay. so um, so he, when he was about to translate uh, gabriel garcia marquez uh, novel uh, into english i think it was uh, 100 years of solitude or something so he was asked uh, so uh, do you think your uh, spanish is good enough for uh, translating this mm-hmm. novel so he mm-hmm. said i am not too much worried about my spanish but uh, uh, what i am thinking is whether my english is good enough ah uh-huh. okay <laughs> so he was not worried much about the target language he was mm-hmm. uh, sorry the source language because uh-huh. he, he was more concerned whether his target language is good enough uh-huh. so uh, yeah so that is what i meant that when i said that uh, your target language uh, must must be your mother tongue mm. so um, yeah obviously in when you are translating from uh, japanese into english um sometimes you have to search for that exact word that correct word that correct nuance uh, when you are translating into marathi uh, i mean because it's my mother tongue uh 
most of the time you know the 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 words or that particular phrase it comes out naturally i mean of mm. course later on i have to like see whether whether it is appropriate or not but uh, <laughs> it it just comes naturally because because, because it's my mother tongue so like marathi language it's like it's living inside me mm. um, that is not the case in english i mean of course i use english in uh, my my work in my everyday life but still it's it's not my mother tongue so um sometimes i i really have to uh, you know look for that that particular mm. exact word or phrase or mm. uh, some idiomatic expression mm. um uh, for example um, you know um um Uh, there was in like in japanese history uh, mm. there was a very very decisive battle uh, at mm. a place near tokyo uh, called sekigahara and okay. uh, that uh, you know that battle really changed the course of history of japan mm. and uh, before that like japan was uh, fragmented fragmented into different uh, you know it was ruled by different feudal landlords and then mm. uh, then there was a landlord who finally defeated everybody in mm. that battle battle of Seki, sekigahara and then japan got united under one rule okay. so um uh so they they have this pro, pro, you know uh, idiomatic expression that uh, mm. like this like if somebody is finally defeated finally mm. defeated uh mm. uh so that became his sekigahara or that incident became his sekigahara or mm-hmm. uh you know now if you have to translate that into marathi then mm-hmm. you immediately you like you, uh, you know you uh, uh, it comes to my mind that um, uh that's a panipat jhal you know, oh. like we have this battle of panipat yes but yeah but in english uh, there is a phrase like that mm-hmm. proved to be his waterloo oh. that proved to be his waterloo but i had to i had to look for that i mean it you know mm-hmm. uh, whether there is any such equivalent english english mm-hmm. idiomatic expression so then mm-hmm. i had to look and then you know the battle of waterloo like when where napoleon was finally defeated so they mm-hmm. have this you know that proved to be his waterloo but in case of marathi like it it just came out gradual mm-hmm. you know uh, naturally, naturally. Mm-hmm. so i think that's that's the difference when mm-hmm. when the target language is your mother tongue correct uh, correct wow nice and uh, you have uh, you like to learn languages right so in addition yeah. to japanese you have uh, also learned korean and portuguese and esperanto uh, so yeah. please tell us about um, it yeah so uh in in uh, jawarlal nehru university when uh, you mm-hmm. i was i was doing my graduation in uh, japanese mm-hmm. uh we had we also had to uh, select uh, two other optional subjects mm-hmm. apart from our main japanese courses and um, and we could uh, if we wanted we could choose one more foreign languages and uh, so there were at that time there was i think for as an optional course there was french the korean and uh, maybe portuguese also mm-hmm. uh so i i chose korean uh, and we had to uh, do that option the, the those optional courses for uh, uh, two years that is four semesters mm-hmm. so i i learned uh, korean for uh, four semesters and korean is again uh, grammatically very similar to japanese and uh, even uh, vocabulary is also very uh, similar because uh, in case of korean as well as japanese um, mm-hmm. a lot of their vocabulary has actually come from china okay mm-hmm. yeah so so like in case of korean it's called sino korean vocabulary or in case of japanese it's like sino japanese vocabulary Mm-hmm. so so it's very similar so for example uh, like a student mm-hmm. in japanese it's called gakse and in mm-hmm. korean it's called hakseng ah okay hakseng yeah mm-hmm. or um, a teacher like in mm-hmm. japanese it's called sensei mm-hmm. and in korean it's called sanseng ah sanseng mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. you know the so 
so actually uh, learning japanese and korean together uh, it uh, it's actually very easy uh, mm-hmm. that's what i found out um so that was and and when i was in uh, japan for one year on a scholarship uh, mm-hmm. we also had a vacation uh, mm-hmm. and uh, i i had uh, korean friends there in japan korean okay. students who had also uh, come on scholarships and mm-hmm. so uh, i actually visited korea for one week during uh, that mm-hmm. vacation i i stayed at my uh, uh, two korean fr- uh, friends uh, homes i was in mm-hmm. uh, seoul and uh, so i also got an opportunity to see korea mm-hmm. so uh, mm-hmm. that uh, you know korean i got that added benefit uh, <laughs> after having learning uh, mm-hmm. having learned korean you know uh, because i could i mean use my uh, whatever uh, whatever little korean i i knew <laughs> i i used the used korean to you know the impress those <laughs> korean uh, korean students and make friends and then uh, travel mm-hmm. to korea using their help so maybe that was one benefit right. <laughs> and uh, portuguese uh, was uh, this was recently um, i mean when after i joined uh, eflu Mm-hmm. um in uh, 2017 mm-hmm. uh, uh they started a part time course in uh, portuguese a certificate uh, diploma and later advanced diploma and uh, uh so i i i joined portuguese and i did two years a one year certificate and one year diploma mm-hmm. i had also joined uh, advanced diploma but then i couldn't uh, complete uh, because mm-hmm. of my work related issues and some other things mm-hmm. um esperanto yeah esperanto i think not many people would even know what it is mm-hmm. so it's a very interesting language uh, it was uh, it's a man made language it was in- okay. invented or created by 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 one man Mm-hmm. uh in in uh, 19th century in 1887 it was created by a uh, by an ophthalmologist from uh, oh. poland okay his name was dr ludwig zamenhof mm-hmm. and uh, why he uh, you know uh, got motivated to create that language again it's very interesting mm-hmm. that at that time uh, like he he was born in a place called uh, bialystok in poland at that time it was a part of uh, russian empire mm. and this place was uh, like a multilingual place mm. uh, now this dr zamenhof he himself was a jew okay. and in that place there were uh, jews uh, germans uh, uh, russians and poles okay and they all uh, they had their own languages so mm. so so he could hear all these four languages and uh, there were a lot of misunderstandings between them and quarrels and fights and all because they could not understand uh-huh. each other's languages like po- polish and uh, russian and mm-hmm. uh, yiddish and german and uh, when so during his childhood he was he was really pained to see all this people mm-hmm. fighting because they could not understand each other's languages mm-hmm. and then he decided that okay i will devise a language which would be used by everybody in the world and it would be very easy for everybody okay. to yeah oh. so he he was an like some something of an ideologist so uh, so he uh, devised this language esperanto uh, taking vocabulary from uh, germanic romance and slavic okay. languages mm-hmm. and and he devised it in such a way that with use of some limited uh, prefixes and um, uh, mm-hmm. suffixes you can mm-hmm. create more you know more words so from okay. one word you can create different words mm-hmm. and so so you don't have to remember a vast amount of vocabulary you can mm-hmm. using those logical prefixes and suffixes mm-hmm. uh, you can create you know more uh, new words, words. Uh-huh. so you can even coin your own words and that are perfectly uh, you know uh, acceptable and understood oh, so okay. uh, that, so that is how uh, that language uh, works uh, again the name you know the esperanto again it's very interesting mm-hmm. uh, in uh, in that language he had coined mm-hmm. um 
like uh, espero is like hope and okay. the, and the the suffix anto a n t o hmm. uh, that is uh, like somebody somebody who does that so for example okay. in esperanto like there is a like to learn the verb is learni learni to learn so if okay. you say lernanto lernanto is a student ah uh, learni one who okay. learns huh. so lernanto or to hmm. teach is like instrui so instruanto would be a teacher okay instruanto okay. would be a teacher hmm. lernanto so hmm. similarly and so um so espero and you can combine you know these suffixes and affixes to anything with okay. nouns adjectives and so okay. so espero is the word for hope now hmm. esperanto somebody who hopes oh. somebody who hopes is esperanto so he um, um he published a booklet um mm-hmm. uh, of this language giving all the grammar rules vocabulary and he even uh, you know translated texts into esperanto translated oh. poems he wrote his own poems okay. and and so like it was like a language learning manual mm-hmm. and he uh, he named his language as uh, uh, linguo internacia de doctor esperanto so international okay. language by dr esperanto so huh. dr dr hopeful okay so yeah so later on this uh, you know when this language started spreading then the that name esperanto uh, it became the new name yeah. for the language so everybody started calling it esperanto, esperanto. very very interesting language yeah. uh, and and it has its original literature there are novels and short mm-hmm. stories Uh, oh, okay. lots of novels and short stories written in esperanto and mm-hmm. w- what makes it interesting is is really inter- international like so there are authors from different countries uh, authors mm-hmm. from uh, germany sweden china mm-hmm. hungary japan brazil who have written into written literature okay. into esperanto oh so my god okay yeah 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 so mm-hmm. it's truly like a global literature you Great. can say very very interesting yeah. so i really like that language wow that is amazing and when where does one learn this is it taught in india um, in, in india there are some uh, esperanto clubs in some places and uh, mm-hmm. in fact uh, india has an uh, esperanto federation of india uh, mm-hmm. like uh, federatio uh, esperanto de barato in esperanto india is barato from bharat so um, okay so and that uh, that headquarters is actually in pune ah okay they have this headquarters in pune i i haven't um, been there actually mm-hmm. but uh, esperanto can be learned on your own like there are so many um, free online learning resources and courses yes. okay. there are mm-hmm. books um, you know there is this uh, uh teach yourself series language mm-hmm. learning like you know teach yourself french mm-hmm. teach yourself you must have seen those books right so right. Uh, so they also have a teach yourself ex- esperanto mm-hmm. and now they have uh, recently they have come up, come up with a new new version mm-hmm. of that textbook okay um so wow. and uh, and of course uh, there is uh, this recently this uh, language learning app called duolingo Mm. uh duolingo which has la- language courses of various uh, languages and they also have a esperanto course on duolingo mm. so uh That's in fact nice. it's one language that you can actually learn for entirely free i mean you without mm. without spending a rupee from your pocket you can learn it <laughs> so uh, do you plan to uh, you know translate any literature from esperanto or portuguese have, or, uh, into marathi uh, esperanto i have already translated uh, three short stories into oh, marathi okay. Uh, okay yeah two of them in fact uh, they were published in uh, you must be knowing this kelyane bhashantar uh, yes. yeah so two of them were uh, published in uh, kelyane bhashantar mm-hmm. and one was in another diwali issue so Mm-hmm. yeah um uh, i i really want to trans, uh, translate and publish esperanto literature but again uh, like finding a publisher who would who would you know want to publish literature from 
that uh-huh. language would be a bit uh, tricky but let's see tricky. how it goes yes yes definitely definitely you will find a publisher <laughs> great it was a sorry you are saying something no okay and uh, what are your future plans Uh, translate, translate and publish more and more, I guess, <laughs> and learn more and more languages. <laughs> uh, no, I think I should. Uh, I should limit to what uh, you know. Apart from this, I also, I won't say I learn. I mean, I I like to dabble into languages. Uh, okay. See, it's like this. Uh, uh, you know, uh, like suppose there is a uh, there is a buffet with so mm-hmm. many different dishes. Mm-hmm. so like all the languages of the world like they are like a, you know it's like a buffet table mm-hmm. so if you if you just eat keep on eating just one dish it's it's not it's not very fun you at yes. least have to taste you know different dishes so you have to <laughs> taste different languages i mean that's that's why i i learn i, I won't say i won't use the word learn i like to dabble to dabble different <laughs> languages so you know that du- duolingo uh, i told you about that yes. so i am i'm i'm dabbling into finnish and turkish and oh oh my god but i'm i'm dabbling that's i mean i i won't call it learning so uh, yeah so but yeah definitely uh, at least esperanto i mean al- uh, along with japanese maybe if i can translate and publish more esperanto literature yeah maybe but wow. yeah so the future plan is just translate more publish translate more, more. <laughs> that's wonderful uh, wish you all the best for your plans thank you so much thank you so much and it was lovely having you on the show and a detailed discussion about many things thank you so thank you very much for joining welcome okay Thank you.